Nui Dat Kanga Pad, we called it, uh, was in sort of sections. It was a, a, a huge area, uh, originally grassed and then turned into crush and then it was bitumenized. By the time I was there, it was bitumenized. Uh, on the uh, eastern side, they had eight uh, PSP squares, perforated steel plating squares, that where the eight, you could put up to eight slicks on that. The first four were normally occupied on any given day. Um, on the uh, western side, they had uh, facing into what was Nui Dat, uh, or Sass Hill as we ended up calling it, uh, was the rearm facility for the bush rangers. So there were pads there with, with all the bunding and, and everything else so they could rearm. Re uh, and then up above that on the western side were, I'm going to say, eight petrol platoon uh, refuelling points. So, uh, and we, we hot refuelled all of the aircraft. So the Iroquois could take 1,400 pounds of, uh, of AVTA and we used to hot refuel to 1,200 pounds. Burn 600 pound an hour, so you had two hours of endurance, take off 20 minutes for flying, you had an hour, an hour 40 that you could fly for. And inside our province, that was more than enough to get you anywhere you wanted to go and do anything you wanted to do. So that the process would be, you'd, you'd uh, so for dust off, for example, you would fly up from, from Vung Tower, you'd land on Kanga Pad, you would taxi into the refuel, you would hot refuel so you had 1,200 pounds of gas, so we did that in the morning. You would then hover taxi up, up on the uh, uh, north uh, eastern side, was where the field ambulance was, and around it were uh, pads for the battalions, so, so inside the, the perimeter. So you had, and over the other side of Sass Hill was Luscombe Airfield, which is where Army Aviation was based and which the Caribous used to use. So uh, it was quite a well-developed uh, system and it was all hugely geared for aviation support to, to troops. Um, the hot refuel process, uh, you would land, you'd, you'd open the pilot's doors, um, uh, you stayed strapped in but uh, you kept the engine running uh, and the loadmaster would get out. Uh, we didn't have the front windows on the sliding doors where they'd been pulled out to save weight and so that the window was over the refuel area so that you didn't have to do anything, you just unclipped the, the refuel uh, uh, cover, nozzle in and pump and we'd watch it when it got to 1200 pounds we'd say stop refueling, he'd seal the, reseal the, the, the tank, put the cover on, put the, uh, the fuel nozzle back, climb back in and either hover taxi over to gunship pad, one of the slick pads or up to the dust off area and there you were, you were ready for whatever came your way. Is, is the aircraft, when you're on the pad, is it naturally earthed? Uh, no, you, so, so you, you had earthing wires, uh, there was, uh, you, you had a, uh, it's naturally earthed but of course it's in that the skids have touched the metal and it was a metal plate. But there's rubber bungs between the skids and the body of the aircraft and, and the, the uh, rotor is generating static all the time anyway. So you would, uh, you'd land and, and you would connect the aircraft hull to the PSP plate and then before you actually stuck the nozzle in, on, on the handle of the refueling thing was another clip and you would clip that to the aircraft so you've now earthed everything and then you'd stick the nozzle in. So there's a, a, a total process to zero the, earth the whole process, uh, the whole airframe before you, you do it. And we used to do hot refuels here in Australia um, often, routinely. So, uh, you know, the, the process was, was just a, a, a natural for us. Uh, there are, uh, that know. sounds fundamentally dangerous when you know that rotors are producing I'm, so I'm much not, static. I'm, uh, the only event that we've had that I can recall was when uh, two aircraft mesh rotors in, uh, in New Guinea uh, coming into refuel from bladders. Uh, that's the only event that we, I'm ever aware of us having with refuel. There were some, um, oh, we did refuel one with with diesel instead of AVTUR once, but or we didn't do refuel one, we refueled eight of them that way, but that's a story for another time. So, yeah, uh, it was, by the time I'd got there, it was a 
in my view and, and in my memory, if you like, and knowing what I know now, it was a smooth, effective, safe operation as far as you can get on a two-way rifle range. You know, we were, we were active. Uh, we had processes that were very, very good. Um, an SAS patrol, has anyone explained the SAS insertion and extraction procedure for you yet? A little bit, but if you want to. Okay, well, uh, the, the uh, SAS used to work in five or 10 man patrols and uh, they would be given an area uh, and an insertion pad. Sometimes they would be inserted by means other than helicopter, but often uh, we would do the insertions. And the insertions were a process of taking uh, up to four Iroquois out for a five, well, six Iroquois out, if you will, for a, for a, uh, uh, a five-man patrol where you would have a command and control aircraft. You would have uh, two uh, aircraft carrying uh, uh, troops, potentially, uh, one of them an actual troop carrier and the other being a duplicate, and then you would fly uh, uh, a route that would be organised so that you would fly over the pad and what would happen is the one aircraft would land in the pad, the next one would fly over the top and then the second one would take off. And if you were watching, it looked like two aircraft just flew past so that you could, you could get the troops off in the best possible shape to, 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 do, uh, to have them undetected. And then they would move off to their patrol area and, and do their bit. And uh, if, uh, if they had any problems, I, I mean, you know, we would routinely then go and pick them up. And picking them up, sometimes we would pick them up from pads. You'd plan to pick them up from a pad because landing was much easier than winching. Uh, but we had a process where if, if uh, you couldn't uh, pull them out from a pad, we would do a winch. And the winch process had to be such that you were safe and you were covered and everything else. And we would only do extractions, uh, winch extractions. Uh, you would have a command and control aircraft, which would normally be 01. Uh, 02 and 03 would be troop carrying aircraft, if we say it's a 10 man patrol and it's got in a stash and it's run somewhere to, to get extracted or uh, whatever, you now have to do five two man winches or two, four two man winches and two one man winches to get the troops up. You'd put five in each aircraft. So what, what you would do is you set up the area, you'd have gunships come up. So because these things would happen, uh, the, the worst thing you could hear was one of these beepers go off. I mean, it really brought your heart in your mouth. And a beeper, beeper, come up voice, and you get an SAS patrol 32 as uh, in contact and rain to point whatever for extraction. And, and literally, that was it. It was all pre briefed in the, in the morning thing. So you'd meet at a, a rendezvous point, the gunships would scramble from Nui Dat, the slicks would stop whatever else they were doing and would then form up to go into it. And uh, the lead aircraft would go down, position himself into an interwind hover over the, the troops to be picked up. And the next aircraft, 03, would position himself at 90 degrees so that you had door gun cover around effectively the perimeter for wherever people were coming in. So you, you, you did that. Lead would pick up, or 02 would pick up his troops. Three would then move around in the hover to do the pickup, and four would come down and, and hover behind him. So it took four slicks to pick up 10 guys. Uh, and the gunships would also be uh, on scene the whole time. Um, often you'd have uh, a Kiowa uh, Army light observation helicopter also part of the game, giving information and communications and whatnot. Uh, and it really was a very, very slick, practiced evolution and, uh, uh, and worked really well. Yeah. Uh, the um, picking up a, a, an SAS team after contact was one of the more um, adrenaline inducing moments that you had. Uh, I remember having to pick up a five man patrol. They'd had a contact. They'd won the firefight, but they didn't want to hang in the area, so they ran a distance and the, the, we, we were picking them up. We weren't winching them, we were picking them up uh, from a pad. So as we came down into the pad, I must have had an instructor sitting in the, in the left seat or a check captain because I was in the right seat. And I, 
landed the aircraft, flared it and landed it. And as I put it on the ground, I looked over to the bush and I saw this dark skinned face sort of looking at me. And I went, uh oh. Um, and then it came out of the bush at my height. And when you're sitting in an aerocore, you're pretty high. And it was, a, uh, it was an Australian SAS squad, but it had a Maori bloke with him. And he was about six foot four, vertically and horizontally. And he came out carrying all sorts of things, with this big grin on his face. Uh, but as, when I first saw his face, I thought, uh-oh, we shouldn't be here. Uh, um, and they piled in and away we went, there was no, no issue. But, you know, it's one of those moments where you look and you say, you know, I, I'm not well prepared for this. <laughs> yeah. Did you feel exposed? You know, I don't... <laughs> no. I, I never felt exposed. We had armoured seat covers, and they were more for the appearance than effect. Yeah, a little armour. A little armour plate, plate that would slide on either side, left yeah. side, right side seat. A seat was an armoured seat, had ability to pull it down and roll it back if you got hit they could get you out of the seat allegedly um, uh, we had flak vests and they, they worked we've had guys who took hits uh, through the pit we used to put our survival radio on the chest there was a little pocket on the on the vest and we had one guy who had his radio there and around went through the radio and into the vest and stayed there uh, he kept that for a long while um, we had uh, we had seats hit, uh, the armour seats hit uh, and not penetrated, so they did work. Uh, but also there was actually a huge plate glass piece there, uh, and um, you know it. it uh, but I don't I don't recall the sense of being vulnerable or or anything else. So you know. Uh, yeah, five cents a packet for smokes, five cents a can for beer until they made it free because we were drinking the profits of the mess and they wanted me to go out and fly helicopters all day. What a horrible life.